This is an image of gumbo. It's a one-pot stew that almost always includes okra. It's famous as a Creole dish, part of the great New Orleans food tradition. But I wanted to show you this because gumbo derives from a Bantu word, and it actually means okra among the Bantu people. And those are the people who are found in the south central part of Africa. Okra is also an African word. But it can, remember, there are lots of languages on the continent of Africa. It's like Europe. There are lots of different languages. The word okra comes from where the Sierra Leone people are from, and also from what's part, it's in that area. So in those people from West Africa who worked in the Carolina rice fields, they also worked in the kitchens. And they're the ones who use ingredients that the British settlers were unfamiliar with, but they grow to love. The enslaved cooks from West Africa stewed okra with various meats and lima beans, which is from the New World, tomatoes from the New World, peppers, red peppers, that's also from the New World, some corn, and they called it okra soup. They served it with rice. Um, there's an old, old recipe, the first written recipe of okra soup is in 1770. It's the same recipe as turns up in New Orleans, and it's called gumbo in New Orleans a century later. The reason why we have two names for this is because two different groups of people from Africa were working in these different kitchens. So okra soup is the name of the, the slaves gave it on the East Coast in what's called the Low Country in Georgia and, and South Carolina. Gumbo is the same dish with a different word from the Bantu language. It's the same food and just has a different name because there were different pe pe people in the kitchens were from different parts of Africa using their different words. I think that's just a really interesting story of how we understand where food comes from, who's influencing the diet in early America, and we know that in the very respected and prolific kitchens of the American South. It was African-American cooks who were introducing these wonderful and tasty dishes of the sort of what we think of as some of the most uniquely American food in the world. Of course, rice is going to be a key component to, um, to this recipe, and that is going to be produced in Louisiana and in the Low Country by people who grew up raising rice in their homeland. Africa. Um, along with, oh, Thomas Jefferson grew okra in, at Virginia in Charlottesville. That's his revolutionary garden. I bring that up because he grew so many vegetables and he also grew kale. You know, have you been to a restaurant lately that does not have kale? On the, uh, I have not. And, and a friend of mine says, who is kale's publicist? I want that publicist. It's so true. But Jefferson was always trying new things. He, um, and one of the things that he did when he goes to the White House, he's also bringing lots of fresh vegetables all the time. He loves entertaining with small dinner parties. He does not invite huge groups of people. He invites 12 people to the table because he believes that a small group, he can have his fine French wines and his elite food that he, elite type, we think of it. It's gourmet food that he, a lot of it is inspired by Europe, entertains his guests, and he feels that in a small space, people are more comfortable talking candidly about what they really believe. Often Dolly Madison will be his um, hostess because uh, Jefferson was a widow at the time, and James Madison was usually there with his wife, helping to entertain these small dinner parties. So James Madison follows his mentor in almost everything. But you know, I just know that Dolly Madison took him aside and said, Jemmy, honey, when you're president, we're not entertaining that way. <laughs> we're going to have a whole lot of people, and we're going to serve a lot of liquor and oysters and maybe some ice cream, and we're going to invite people from both sides of the aisle because I really believe that the way, who cares about candid conversations with groups of 12? They already agree with each other. Let's, <laughs> let's invite people who disagree. So that's what they did when, when Dolly Madison becomes first lady. As soon as she's first lady, the doors are open, but you, oh, you come and you come and let's all get together. She was like, she was the queen of Washington and she really was a vivacious hostess and, 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 and Madison was so lucky because he was such a brain trust. I mean, he was just so smart, but not, not so good with the social graces and his wife made up for it. And I love the idea of bringing everybody together. Um, 
one of the things that's interesting to me about the White House kitchen is that they are, they are at this time um, experimenting with new recipes. Jefferson ex inspired some. Some of them were trained um, and formally by chefs that would come over from Europe, including Jefferson's chef, James Hemings. Um, but there were also people who were trained in the, in the kitchen, and one of them was a guy named um, Augustus Jackson. I think that's a great name, Augustus Jackson. And he was working in the Monroe administration. He developed an ice cream churn that's a prototype of the type of ice cream churn we use today, that you churn and has the paddles, the dasher inside. And um, he was a free African American. And the reason why I bring this up is that when we imagine life in the 1820s, we don't think that somebody like, I mean, we don't imagine Augustus Jackson even existing. Here he was working in a kitchen. He invents this ice cream maker, and he goes to Maryland, which was a slave state, and he opens his own ice cream parlor. And it's a huge hit. And he's quite the entrepreneur, and he makes a good living. He makes a good living for his family. And that's the story of Augustus Jackson. You know, I have a PhD in American history, and I thought I knew a lot. I'd never heard of this guy. And the only way I learned about him was looking up ice cream. So that's, I'm just bringing that up as another way to emphasize that there are all sorts of roads to knowledge of different topics. And when you are thinking about historic topics, you can go in at different angles and, and learn new things. And I think um, ice cream is one of my favorite ways of going there. Uh, this is a picture of the gold rush. And I um, include it because it shows the um, Chinese laborers who are working there. Um, a lot of them never actually got a chance, even though they might have found gold, or they ended up not doing so much mining, but doing support for the miners. That meant that they were doing laundry, they were doing um, the more menial tasks. And one of the things they did was cook. And they invented dishes that we know today as chop suey and chow mein, which never existed in China. But they, they did invent them in California. And so later generations of Chinese would come and they'd be taught these recipes and say, what is this food? There? Well, I know, we don't eat it at home. But these, these white people, they like this. So we just give it to them. And um, chop suey actually means chopped entails or chopped, chopped leftovers. It means leftovers, really. So would you like leftovers? Leftovers on rice or leftovers on noodles? If it was on noodles, it would be chow mein. Anyway, but it, they, um, it's an interesting story about how the different cultures m work together. And they create, just like the African-American cooks in um, the American South, these guys will change how, how they interpret Chinese food in California. That's a Hangtown, Hangtown Fry, which is an omelet with um, oysters and bacon. That is a um, famous dish in San Francisco in the mining areas. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But it's a, it's a legend. Um, but a quick story is that a horse thief was sentenced to death in a town that we now call Placerville. Um, it was by a jury. I'm supposed to, the historian, I called the local historical society. He said, is this true? And she said, well, if you're talking about it, you make sure that people understand he wasn't just lynched. He, there was a trial by jury. Placerville was called Hangtown because that's where the court sat. And they called the jury together. The guy was convicted. He was a horse thief. So he was going to be strung up. He was asked what he wanted for his last meal. And he said he wanted a fresh egg omelet with oysters. And Placerville is over near Sacramento, not San Francisco, right? So it took a long time that to bring the oysters <laughs> on ice across the land. And, and gosh, I hope they kept those oysters fresh. That's all I can. But he wouldn't mind because he was going to be hanged, right? Wouldn't matter. So that's called the Hangtown Fry. <laughs> and one more picture from California that I love this. This is. The golden spike, yeah. right? So what do you see here? I'm supposed to use the pointer. I'm so apt to point on it. What is that? So when you see that, in a lot of, lot of images, you'll see that. 
same picture, only they took out the bottle because the temperance people were very worried that this was going to show railroad workers drinking and it was going to influence the working class into thinking that drinking was something you should be doing. And of course, you know what, think about railroad workers. Who deserves a drink more than the guys who finished the Transcontinental Railroad? I don't know, anybody. But um, there they are celebrating. Seriously though, when you look at you'll find it in other sources and there will be no bottle being held up. And it's an example of how strong the um, temperance movement was at that time. Because this is the day, time of the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age, to me, um, is really exemplified, well, at least one side of it. In my, my book, I call this period the um, Gilded Gritty Age, because this is the era right after the Civil War that runs, some people say, up to like 1900. It's the age of industrialization, of exploited factory workers, and robber barons, or captains of enterprise making fortunes and nobody's laughing. It's actually both, usually, right? I mean, it's not just one or another. It's, people are complicated. They have both sides. They're both things going on at the same time. They're, but they're making fortunes in heavy industries like steel, mining, and railroads. And these guys had a lot of capital. Their wives and daughters had a lot of money to spend. And this was a time when suddenly in America you start seeing luxury hotels and luxury restaurants. Antoine's in New Orleans, still going strong. It was an early one, Delmonico's. This is in New York City. Here's a shot. These guys like to party like it was 1899. <laughs> and Delmonico's was where they would go to have a good time and huge meals, multi-course. And by multi-course, I don't mean six or seven courses. I mean, you know, nine to 12 courses. Stanford White, the famous architect of Bon Vivant might be present, along with Diamond Jim Brady, the Vanderbilts, Carnegie's, Astors, and authors um, like Mark Twain, who gave the era the name the Gilded Age, and Charles Dickens, even the Prince of Wales. They had enough money to patronize gourmet restaurants and places like Delmonico's flourished. Delmonico's then hires the first celebrity chef. This is not a modern invention. This is not depending on the food channel. His name was Charles Ranhofer. And Ranhofer went on to invent many dishes that are very famous today, including Eggs Benedict and Lobster Newberg, for example. He modified, I'm just going to get a little sip here of non-alcoholic cider. <laughs> he modified a Parisian dessert and rechristened it Baked Alaska. Because not only was this guy a great chef, he was a brilliant marketer. United States Secretary of State William Seward had just purchased millions of acres from a bankrupt Russia and in a controversial move acquired what critics denounced as a frozen wasteland or Seward's folly. So an elegant frozen dessert enrobed in white meringue benefited from the visibility of this public debate by being called Baked Alaska. It vividly illustrates the contradictions of the Gilded Age. In today's era, today's money, it costs about $40 per serving, which I have never been to a rest any restaurant that where a single serving of a dessert cost $40. That's pretty steep, even for today. Originally, Ranhofer made it from walnut spice cake topped with rich banana ice cream and then covered in swirls of meringue. Remember, this was a very complicated dessert to make. You know those hand double egg beaters? Can you imagine how long it took to make meringue for a whole restaurant just using double? Well, those double egg beaters hadn't been invented. So they were still doing everything by whisk. Each step of the process of making this cake involved a team of workers and a lot of brute st strength. From cutting the ice that you would need up in New York, you'd cut it up on the Hudson, ship it down by barge, and pack it in ice houses in sawdust to last for the summer, maybe up to October even. Churning the ice cream, adjusting the restaurant ovens, um, which were of course fueled by coal and firewood, and you had to make sure that the ovens were heating evenly for the cake, and then you had to brown the meringue a moment before serving. This is a complicated dish to make in the Gilded Age. Today, of course, you buy a really good pound cake. I mean, you can buy really good cake, and you can, you can even buy really good ice cream. I swear by Ben and Jerry's 
ice cream if you're going to make a baked Alaska. And then you have to make the meringue all by yourself. But I think you can do that. 